Again, my name is Angela Exner. I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just had a great morning with these guys. Matt and Eric set a great uh, foundation for many of the things that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And uh, great working with both of them. I, I went to their office once in a while and go, uh, can you explain this? So great to, to have them in the office as well. With understanding Mary and the value of suffering, my hope today is once we're done with this, that it helps you to become more um, aware of the suffering in your life and the value of it, because it's really against what society teaches. And I'm hoping that it becomes a part of your daily life and about your relationship with God. So this is our hope for today. One thing about Mary is a lot of times we grow in understanding of her. When I first was at the a Catholic University, I would go into the chapel where there was this beautiful tabernacle. And I would go in there and I'd start to pray. And these people would come in and they'd genuflect to Jesus in the tabernacle. And then they'd go over to a statue of Mary. And they'd like, sometimes they'd just lay out prostrate. You know, other times they'd like go on their knees and put their head right on the floor and start praying. And I have to admit, when I first started in my relationship with God, I was, you know, sharing prayer. And this really bothered me. I'm like, hello, that's a statue and that's God. What are you guys doing? And I didn't say it, like, to anyone out loud, but you know how in your head you can get really judgmental and go down that wrong path? So I was, that's where I was at. And I, I went to one of my friends, and I said, okay, I just got to share this. I don't know what's going on. Why is it when we're in the, t in the chapel, you know, this is going on with Mary? And he said, you know, Angela, I think this would help you. You should read this book called Total Consecration by St. Louis de Montfort. And um, the devout life, um, the devout life uh, about Mary. And I started to read it. At first, I was just going to whip through it and figure it out. And you can't read that book fast. True devotion. That's what it's called. True devotion. And so I started reading this book. And I had to read it very slowly because it just started penetrating my heart and my mind. And I got through this book. And by the time I was done, I was like, I get it. Mother Mary in her intercession presents things to God like we never could. And there's so many beautiful analogies that they have in the Bible and that St. Um, de Montfort uses. But at the end was this consecration. And he said, you know, there's this 33-day consecration. And again, not knowing very much, I said, okay, I'll, I'll start this consecration. I didn't know it's supposed to end on a feast day or anything like that. I just started it was doing my thing and every day, again, through these prayers of consecration, growing closer and closer to Our Lady. And this Tuesday morning, I'll never forget, it was the last day of my consecration, and my household sisters, we come together and we pray in the morning, and then we get until 7, and then we go off and get ready for classes and go to, go to class. Well, we were doing our Tuesday morning prayer, and all of a sudden, one of the girls said, you know, today's the Feast of the Holy Rosary. And so after we're done with our prayers, why don't we just pray a little bit of our rosary and see how far we get. And then we'll go to class. So we're like, okay. And me being a great Catholic, I didn't even have a rosary on me. <laughs> and so my friend Nancy gave me her rosary. So we start praying. And as we're praying, and again, it's the last day of the consecration, um, I just start to bawl. I just start crying. And by the time, we only got through three decades and had to go to class. But by the time we got to the third decade, I was crying so hard I couldn't even talk. And my, my household sisters like look up, you know, because when you're in prayer mode. But they looked up and they looked at me and they're like, Angela, what's wrong? And I was like, I couldn't talk. All I could do was hold up my rosary. And on this side were the three beads of the rosary that we prayed. And on this side were the three that, or the two that we had. And they could see that this side had turned to gold. And I just sat there and I, and I couldn't talk and I couldn't say anything. But what it said to me was, Mary said, I heard you. I heard you. And from that moment on, what happened in my life was this. Mary took me on this foot race to her son. My relationship with God from that moment on went from a theological knowledge of him. I can read a lot and know a lot. 
but it went to this whole other level of where I completely and totally fell in love with him. And he entered into my life and he became my protector, my provider, my truest love, and there was this intimate, intimate love story. And then I got to know my father in heaven, God the Father, and then I got to know the spirit, you know, Mary's spouse. And she always just, I mean, led me to them. She led me to God over and over again and in a very powerful way to her son, Jesus Christ. And that's what Mary does. And that's why I open up with that story is, is to share with you, Mary has this incredible gift. She's never, never, and you, you see in the Bible, she's never talking about herself. She's always pointing. It's always to our Lord. And that's where she leads us. So... This talk today is based on two writings of blessed John Paul II. And he does an incredible job with Redemptress Modern, Mother of the Redeemer. And then the other one is Salvific Suffering. Okay? These are writings by blessed Pope John Paul II. I highly recommend that you, you read these. They're not as complex as a lot of his other writings. Okay? So they're easier to understand. But one thing about Blessed Pope John Paul II is that he always starts off, most of his writings start off with scripture. And he, he's so saturated in scripture that it just, it naturally flows out of almost every paragraph. And so in the Redemptus Mater, he starts off with this incredible scripture and he says, the mother of the Redeemer has a precise place in the plan of salvation, for when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, Redemptus Mater, there's a lot of it. He just breaks that down and, and is pretty much summed up in that when Jesus comes in the fullness of time, when he comes and, and it says there, had fully come, he comes in the fullness of time, and Paul speaks about that as well. To understand that God, who's bigger than heaven and earth, bigger than time, entered into time. And by him entering into time, he actually redeemed it. He redeemed time. And this begins the church's journey, and it begins with the woman of Mary. He comes into Mary in this beautiful way, and they are so connected, Christ and Mary, that they're indissolubly joined. They're, they're completely connected. Mother Mary, in the physical sense, you look at a mother, and Jesus is there within her womb, in the Holy of Holies, and He's growing, and he's actually feeding off of her. He's, getting, he's being nurtured by her blood, her oxygen, her food. He gets his human nature from Our Lady. How are we saved? What does it say? A lot of times we're saved by the blood of the Lamb. Where did that blood come from? You think about that, how his humanity and that aspect of him came from Our Lady, and that she really, truly helped with that forming him in her womb and how she nurtured and fed him and that she was the first tabernacle the holy of holies and i love the way um matt broke that down in that picture that he had of our lady on top of the tabernacle so mary's the first tabernacle and we too have to recognize here that god has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying abba father because we are adopted sons we are adopted children of mary and she nurtures and feeds us as well in the order of grace. So we see how Mary comes into this world and that her and, and Jesus are truly together as one. You have to remember that all that Mary does, all that she is, flows from her relationship with God. Completely and totally. She's doing the will of God in all that she is. Her entire life is a fiat her yes and of course we see her first yes when god 
came to her. And hence we start the understanding of Mary's life. Her life is one of suffering. Okay? Part of it, because what in Genesis 3.15, as they talked about earlier, who does she have complete and total enmity with? The evil one, yeah, the devil. She has complete and total opposition with the devil. She is completely sinless. So what's gonna, what is her life going to be like? <coughs> a battle. It is a battle between good and evil. She has chosen to be this lady, this incredible woman. And he knew it, and he was after her, and he was after her child, as we see in Revelation 12, if you want to bring that analogy. But she suffered. So here comes this angel. We're going to talk a little bit about her life. This angel comes into her life and says, Hail, full of grace. Karakatomene. Okay, highly favored one, however you want to interpret the scripture. Hail, full of grace. And he says to her, you're going to bear the child of God. The Messiah. Emmanuel, the Savior. And she, she's looking at this and, and she says, you know, she asks a couple questions first and then, yes, okay, I'll do this. But she's betrothed to Joseph. Now, looking at Mary's life, we've got to see a couple of things. Number one, she completely trusts God. And that's key. She has complete faith and trust in him. She chooses, even though she's immaculately conceived and she never sins, she chooses not to sin. She chooses to say yes. She chooses to participate in the divine life of God. So she had to trust that God was going to take care of things, that her being betrothed to Joseph, that things would be explained. What did God do? He, he completely explained things to Joseph. All right? Angel in a dream. So that's the beginning. She, she says yes, but she knows there's going to be trouble along the way. Then, I love this part where she, you know, people don't talk about this much, but she is fully pregnant. And they're going to Bethlehem. I'm like, have, I mean, if you think about that, you are really, really pregnant, and you're going on this trip to Bethlehem, and when you get to town, you're just like, I'm done. Give me a room. <laughs> Set me down. Okay? No. In it. There's no room in the inn. Okay, why is this even in scripture? Because she's fully pregnant. There's no room in the inn. Okay, where are we going? We gotta go to a stable. Okay, I'm a North Dakota, North Dakota girl, if you haven't figured it out yet by my accent. I grew up on a farm. I know what those things smell like. Okay? <laughs> you think about Mary, and she's in this place, and Joseph, now, knowing men, the way they take care of their wives as well, that had to have been hard on Joseph. Probably harder than it was on Mary. You know, saying, I, I want to provide. She's having God's child. You know, and here we are, we're in a stable. But God took care of it all. And so there's this suffering in that aspect. But then with every suffering, when you trust God, when you give your life to God, you trust him, there comes this incredible joy. And she has this joy in her life. The shepherds come and they tell her about the angels. You know? Then a couple of days later, you know, she's not in a stable anymore. She's in the house. And the magi come and bring her these gifts. Okay? So there's, there's suffering, but when you trust God, there's also joy. There's also an incredible gift from God. We don't always understand it. So we have that aspect. And then we have the next aspect of the life is she goes to the presentation. And again, she's presenting Jesus in the temple. She's, and they're joined. So she's presenting herself as well. Neither one of them have sinned, but yet Jewish law. So they do this be beautiful presentation, giving their, their lives to God. And who's there but Simeon? Suffering again. It's, if you ever follow the seven sorrows of Mary, this is one of them. You know. So they're there, and he, he's telling her, oh, you know, this is him. This is the Messiah. And he's all excited about it. But then he, he says, but, he says, he will be a sign of contradiction. And Mary, Mary, you know, she's got the preternatural gifts, understanding that she's like, his mission then is going to be one, and Pope John Paul II talks about this, of misunderstanding and sorrow. So right away, there's her baby, only, at, you know, what, eight, years, eight days old? And he's saying, 
Your son's life is going to be a mission of misunderstanding and sorrow. So much so that your heart, too, will be pierced by a sword, or your soul will be pierced by, by a sword. Okay, again, we're seeing that connect with Mary and Jesus. Whew, okay. She's going to ponder that in her heart for a while. Do you know she doesn't go off and gab about these things like other women do? <laughs> she ponders these things in her heart. Okay, we've got to remember that. She ponders these things in her heart. Then, another, another thing that uh, sorrow in the seven sorrows is the flight into Egypt. I think for me, besides the crucifix, which, or the crucifixion, which we'll get to, for me, I think this would be the hardest sorrow before that because the angel tells Joseph they get up he says you gotta you gotta leave and they're fleeing to Egypt now I can't imagine going through what Mary did knowing that back there all those young boys two years of age and younger were slaughtered so that your son could be saved I can't imagine her sorrow in that. She trusted God. She loved him and she trusted him. And so they, they disappeared and they left their family and their friends and their life behind and they disappeared for a while and had their son. And he was, you know, by the angel and Joseph listening, Joseph listening, did what needed to be done, but another sorrow in her part. So we look at this sorrow, and you know, what a great place to be today, because so many aspects of Our Lady's life is here in the windows. And I, I love the visuals of it. But we have to then look at our own lives. In our society today, we are told to do anything to avoid suffering. And that any kind of weakness is bad. Okay? They have these little tests, you know, in utero. Oh my goodness, your baby might have Down syndrome. My sister was told that her, her son would have Down syndrome and suggested that little Ethan be aborted. And it was a shock to Amy and Tom, I'll admit that. But they just turned it into prayer and they said, you know what? God's will be done. God's will be done. And they had a healthy, perfectly healthy little boy named Ethan. Okay? Now, as we get older, a lot of times they say, okay, you're no good to society anymore. Just, you know, instead of, you know, just dying naturally, why don't we help you along? You know? They don't get it. Our society doesn't get it. And I'm here to tell you that some of the greatest saints, some of the greatest work you can do is when you are weak. Jesus Christ in his life lived his entire life to get to the weakest moment of his life. He lived to get to that point on the cross. And when we understand that, we have to really look at how that pertains to us again. Jesus lived his entire life to get to that point. His weakest, most vital point. And what happened to that? The greatest work of salvation, redemption into the world. That is beautiful. And that's where our Protestant brothers, they don't like putting Jesus on the cross. They said he rose from the dead. Yeah, he rose from the dead. But what does he tell us to do? We have to carry our cross. But more importantly, in Colossians 1.24, it said, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings because I am making up what is lacking in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, his church. Now, that's not saying that anything is lacking in his suffering, in his redemption. He redeemed us here. He, wrote, he died and he rose. But love, love is ever growing. Love is ever giving. 
Love is always there, and we are called to live in that love, to participate in that love, and to participate in the life of Christ. So this brings me to the mystical body of Christ. I'm not going to go too much into it, because um, Father Goodyear is going to talk about purgatory. So one thing about the mystical body of Christ is... i got to get used to this clicker here. The mystical body of Christ, you understand that you have the head, that's Jesus, okay? And the church triumphant is those saints in heaven, right? Saints in heaven, they're part of the body of Christ. Then you have the church suffering, those souls in purgatory. And you have the church militant, that's us. We're the military. We're the ones doing the battle in a whole other sense. Now, to break this down in the mystical body of Christ, God's the head. Sometimes they call Mary the neck. But Jesus is the head of the body, and he, he gave us this mystical body of Christ, and we're to participate in the life of God. So my thing is, I'll just, I'll just break this down in, in a very blunt way, but let's say this arm, my right arm, let's call this Sarah. She's in the church militant. She's here on earth. And this arm, my left arm, we'll call her Holly. Okay, so Sarah and Holly, they grew up in these great Catholic homes. They grew up praying the rosary. They, they have this really wonderful, holy life, go to Catholic school and everything. And then they leave, and there's choices to be made. Okay, now Holly over here, Holly meets the man of her dreams. And they get married, and they decide to have, you know, the perfect Catholic family. They're going to have, you know, ten children, and um, they're going to be the priest's best friend, and he's going to come over to dinner at their house and just love them, you know, and love to hang out with their family. And they're going to homeschool, and they're going to have everything, you know, just the perfect Catholic, you know, family life. And so this, that's Holly over here with her husband. And then there's Sarah. Now Sarah leaves, and she decides, you know what? I just. I've lived in this strict house for this long, and I just want to go do my own thing, and I'm, uh, and she chooses to walk away from the Lord and go on another path, okay? So again, just being blunt, I'm going to bring Sarah right away into Morrison. So uh, yeah, we're talking about the mystical body of Christ. I'm trying to show you how it works. So Sarah walks away from the Lord and starts to live the life of the world. So she gets pregnant, and she knows what's going on here. With full knowledge of what's, what's going on, with full consent, she decides to abort this child. Okay? Full knowledge, full consent, and we, it's a grievous offense against God. So what happens to her when she does that? She's cut off from the mystical body of Christ. She cuts herself off. Okay? She chooses that lifestyle, and she's cut off from the body of Christ. So what happens to the body if you lost your right arm? And especially if you're right-handed. Okay, the rest of your body has to start working. Like, the left hand has to learn how to actually write well, if you're right-handed. Um, sometimes you might use your foot, you know, to kick open things and do stuff. But the rest of your body will compensate for the loss of the limb. Right? That's how the mystical body works. We, we have to cooperate. So what happens? God says, where sin is, grace abounds evermore. Where sin is, grace abounds evermore. Well, here's the sin. Does God cause suffering? No. Does God allow suffering? Yes. yes. He does. Holly, on this hand, has this great husband ready to live this Catholic faith, Catholic life, and they start to try to have children. And they find that they can't. They can't have children. Now, I've counseled women who, who've gone through abortions, and that's tough. But counseling women who can't have children, that's tough too. That's a heavy burden. Now, Holly has two choices. She can give in to what's, what's going on in her life right now. She can get become very angry and bitter, and say, you know what, God? I lived this life for you. I gave my life. I did everything right. Now, what's going on? What is going on? Not only can I not provide this for my husband,
husband, and the sorrow maybe that he has too, of not being able to have this life with his wife, they can, they can fall into that sorrow and that hate and that anger, and she can choose to give into that. That can be her choice. And say, you know what? I've had enough. Or, she can say, Lord, I don't understand. And this hurts. And I, I don't feel like a woman sometimes because of this. And I feel like I'm failing my husband because of this and my marriage. And I feel really empty right now. And I don't know what to do with this. But I trust you. So you know what? I'm just going to keep putting it on the altar. I'm going to keep laying it right there. I'm going to offer it up. I'm going to trust you. And it hurts. But I love you. I know you know what's going on. Even if I don't love you. That's your choice. That's all of our choices. We're like Mary, where we choose. We choose to trust. No matter how hard it is. And sometimes, I know some of my greatest prayers are when I'm trying to put it on the altar, and I'm not doing a good job, and I get very mad. I'm like, Lord, look. <laughs> and it's funny, because I'll go to my spiritual director, and I'll say, I really got mad at God the other day. And he goes, good, you had an honest prayer. <laughs> and it is, I mean, that, when we are weak like that, when we are suffering, that is when we're the closest with him. When we're doing our own thing, hey, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, do we need God? I can do that on my own. What you're good at, a lot of times you don't invite God into, because I got it, I got this one, I'm good at this. But what you're weak at, what you don't do well, Lord, I need some help. And that's the thing. Our society tells us that our weaknesses are bad and our strengths are good. Well, great. Our strengths are great if they're redeemed. Our strengths are great if they're in participation with God. But a lot of times we're not inviting God into our strengths. Hopefully we are in this room, or so. But a lot of the times it's in our weaknesses. Is where we come to know God. In that suffering that brings us to our knees. The other part of it is, is the Mass. Well, actually... See, this is why I don't like PowerPoints. Because I have something that I skipped. <laughs> <laughs> so Romans 5.35... More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance, endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. This, the reading today at Mass, you know, his eyes are fixed on Christ. He's fixed there. When we suffer, when we go through these trials, it's kind of like a workout, you know? It's not easy the first time, but as you, as you get going and growing in this virtue, and a lot of it through suffering, this is what makes you a better person. This is what creates you to become a saint, okay? God created you to live with him forever in heaven. Okay, you know the Baltimore Catechism to know, love, and serve him in this world so you can be with him forever in heaven. Okay, so we were created to be with God forever in heaven. We're created to be of the church triumphant. Okay, this is where sometimes we go wrong though. A lot of us, and Eric touched on this earlier, a lot of us, our aim is purgatory. Okay, we just got to get to purgatory and we're good. I'm sure Father's going to touch on this, but you know the pains of purgatory are far greater than any pain we could experience here on earth. My aim's heaven. I want to go to heaven because if I miss, I got purgatory. If my aim is purgatory and I miss, <laughs> okay. We are created to be 
with God forever. And it's about being in Trinitarian love. God the Father loves the Son, pours himself out completely and totally into his Son. And his Son doesn't take that on and go, thanks, Dad. He gives everything right back to the Father. And so there's this continual outpouring of love that is so real that it begets the third person, okay? Begotten of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. We are called to live in that Trinitarian life. We are called to live in love. Heaven is not a place, it's a person. That's what, um, well, it was Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict has said. We are called to live in the Trinitarian love. And when we love, that's when we can truly suffer. You cannot suffer unless you love. Unless there's love in your heart, the whole thing doesn't make sense. So with the mystical body of Christ, we have this gift. I want you to look at the, I love this picture. I took this from um, Christ the King in Sarasota. It's the 12th station. I love this because you see Mary suffering here. Mary, this is her son. And when you think about this day, her son went through the tortures that no one should go through, despised and rejected by men. I mean, just the agony in the garden. I want you to think about this. I want you to think of the worst, don't say it out loud, the worst thing that you, you've ever done in your life and how that makes you feel. You just kind of dwell on that for a couple of seconds. Somewhere where you really messed up. Now I want you to start thinking about the many things you've done in your life. It's not a good place to be, is it? I don't, you don't like to go there. Now think about how you feel there in that, and then think about if you had to take on the sins of everyone just at your table and carry that. How about if you had to carry everyone in this room? You think about that night, the agony in the garden, I don't know how, how Jesus survived that. <clears throat> Taking on all of our sins, past, present, and future, all of humanity on that one night. And Mary being indissolubly joined. You know how mothers are with their children. There's a connection there. Mary was the white martyr through this. Her soul was pierced as well. Jesus is arrested, scourged. He's not whips, he was scourged. Crowned with thorns, not rose thorns. Those thorns that went right through his skull. Mary meets him on the way. I mean, and she literally is looking at her son and he's shredded from head to toe. His body's shredded. And she's looking at her son. He goes up to Golgotha and he's crucified and she stands. How she stood at the foot of the cross is amazing. But she stood because, and Pope John Paul II talks about this hidden life. She had these years with Christ that we have no idea. She was the first human 
to experience the mystery of Christ. Her entire life, she was walking, and, and he calls it a pilgrimage, and he actually gets it from Lumen Gentium, but this pilgrimage of faith. She walked this path, this pilgrimage of faith, completely trusting in God. And this is a prefigurement, you know, when he dies for three days, of when he was lost for three, three days. She stands at the foot of the cross. But she's not standing alone. She, she has her faith. She has God. I, I, God is literally, I feel, keeping her standing there. It's through her faith, through her trust in God. And that's what a life of suffering is. We are called to suffer, and it is a gift. Our life of suffering is a complete and total gift, and a lot of us don't recognize that. We get to participate in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, and we rejoice in that. We rejoice. Okay, and when you're in the midst of it, are you rejoicing? No. But God gives us those moments in the midst of it where we rejoice. And we can say, let me offer this up. It's not easy. It's not easy when you're in it. But God gives you those moments of grace. And when you get those moments of grace, you lay it on the altar. You lay it on the altar at all the masses said throughout the world today, and you let that grace go to wherever it needs to go to. It may go to Sarah, who was cut off from the body of Christ. And by you offering it up, she might have that moment where she doesn't feel worthless, and she isn't, you know, feel horrible about what she did. And she realizes that the church still loves her and that she is welcome. And all she needs to do is humble herself to go to confession and truly confess that, that the church loves her. And maybe then she'll even find out that she has a little saint in heaven who is interceding for her and for the, her soul. That's how the mystical body works. We have this gift of weakness, of suffering. It is a gift. I was, um, for a very short time, I entered in for two years, I was uh, an inquirer at a Benedictine Oblate community. And when I first got there, everybody kept telling me, Angela, you truly are a gift. And I was like, yay, I'm a gift. <laughs> but after going through spiritual direction for a while, I came to realize this language of the community. And basically it is this. There are certain people in your life that come into your life, and a lot of times we don't like them. They may be annoying and hard to deal with. But the thing is, they have been put in your life to help you grow. Because a lot of times when you're like, oh, this person's doing this or do this or this, or you get angry at that person. Basically, it's God's way of saying, why don't you turn that judgment around and look at yourself? You know, the whole um, speck versus, uh, not boulder, plank. plank, thank you, in your own eye. A lot of times when those people come into our life who are a little annoying or that's hard to put up with, it's really God saying, this is something you need to work on. Turn it around, look at yourself. Where are you lacking charity? Where are you lacking this gift? Where can you grow here? And it's a grace. And it's a gift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I learned real quick I'm a gift. <laughs> so, but those, it truly is, in that spirituality, you have to look at how is God asking you to grow? Where is the sandpaper that's, you know, sanding off the stone, the Michelangelo's, you know, he's, he's creating the great David or whatever, and he's got the sandpaper for those little rough edges. There are people who are sandpaper in our lives, but it's made, if we take that and we don't go, you know, and go talk about people and how they're annoying you, but you look at them and you say, you're a gift. Okay, that's a little hard, I know. But... <laughs> We can. 
we can. And let me tell you, when you've got 22 women living together in one roof with one another all the time, you learn <laughs> how to live that, that life. So it's, it's a gift. Our life is, that's how we're to live. But how do we do that? We can't do it without love, but we can't do it without grace. And the grace is the suffering. The grace is the altar. So when you go to Mass, you know at Mass, when you put the money in the basket? Everybody's singing their song and they're putting money in the basket? What is going on? What are we supposed to be doing at that moment? Giving our gifts. Giving our gifts. Let me tell you, this is my gift at that moment in Mass. It's like, you know those potato bags, those big heavy potato bags, but mine's like got boulders in the back of it. And spiritually, at that moment at Mass, I am like walking up, and I'm like, <laughs> laying it down on the altar. Because the things that go on in my life, I'm, I'm just like, Lord, here it is. I can't do it. You know, God says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. We give those things over to the Lord. And at the power of the Mass, that's the most powerful moment. I mean, where we can participate in the salvation of others, in our own salvation, helping in the mystical body of Christ, those here on earth, those in the next life, we need to embrace our suffering, as Mary did. This is what we did to her son. She stood. Now, you know what? We did this by our sins. We're the ones that shredded him. We are the ones who put the nails in his hands and his feet. We did that. Each and every one of us. When we die, we'll realize what wounds we caused. We're the ones who put him on that cross, who caused him to suffer by our sins. He would have never had to do that without the fall of man. And guess what? That was her son. But we are also her children. And so she comes to us and she embraces us and she walks with us and she brings us to the love of her son. She leads us to him. That is her role. She is our mother in the order of grace. She is our spiritual mother and we trust her in that. And that's how what true love is. True love is forgiveness. True love does not have room for hate. True love is laying your own life down. So my challenge for you today is to imitate Our Lady in so many ways, but the greatest of them is to be in relationship. You cannot live this life without relationship with God. You cannot live this life without being intimately in love with Him. And the way to get there is Our Lady. Mother Mary will lead us to her son. She'll lead us to this point where we can truly live in the suffering and in this grace. So we call upon all of you, help us in the mystical body of Christ. Don't let your suffering go to waste. Embrace the gifts. And when society tells you, uh-uh, you know better. This is a gift and this is a grace and we should embrace it. And Our Lady always shows us how. So, in closing, I just want to share with you again to read these documents by Blessed Pope John Paul II, Redemptress Modern, and um, Salvific Suffering. They're beautiful gifts of the Lord. And, um, I think that's about it. So God bless you and thank you for coming today.